Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mac One, the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra. My name is Gary Hills, I am a QAM volunteer, and you're going to hear a conversation I recently had with our restoration and conservation manager at the Air Museum, Rick Wilkins. Rick has what he calls an obsession. Uh, a hobby, whatever you might call it. He has spent many, many years of his life tracking down lost wrecks of aircraft that have either crash-landed or been perhaps shot down during the Second World War. And uh, he has an an amazing uh, dossier of photographs and map references and uh, uh, journal entries and so on from all of those years of uh, wreck hunting. So this is my conversation with Rick Wilkins. We're in Hangar 2 at the Queensland Air Museum and uh, I'm sitting here with the current Restoration and Conservation Manager, Rick Wilkins. G'day, Rick. Hey, Gary. Thanks for joining me today to tell me about what I would call a most fascinating hobby. I don't know if you call it a hobby, but we'll come to that. Um, first of all, just explain to those of us who, are, who are, perhaps don't know you where you're from and uh, what your background is in aviation. Um, it's probably an obsession rather than a hobby. Um, I grew up in Melbourne, um, did my education in Melbourne, did an apprenticeship in Melbourne, uh, was a service stage, uh, service manager at a dealership and decided that I should go and have a look at Australia. So I left uh, Melbourne and travelled all the way around. Now I'm in Queensland, so it's taken me about 30 years to get here, but seen a lot between there and here. Um, My background in aviation is I've always had something to do with aircraft. As a kid there was always aircraft laying in paddocks near where I grew up. Um, I've always, I I have an interest in aviation but I seem to stumble on aircraft accidents or wreck sites. Um, I've never really wanted to learn to fly. I just get the enjoyment out of of seeing aircraft after they've come to grief um, and have a look at that. Sort of interested in the engineering side of it or the mechanical side of it. Have a look at why I think the accident happened. Um, And have been to um, well over 100. Either wreck sites or a wrecked aircraft, accident aircraft, one of the two. Okay, well before we get to that, what's your army story? Um, I got to Darwin, they formed a new a unit in Darwin which was a an army reserve unit which took over one of the roles from SAS in regards to uh, coastal and domestic surveillance so my unit was formed initially as an infantry unit and then we went surveillance um, and did coastal stuff um, there's a lot of full-time duty involved in it I went full-time duty on a number of occasions um, I did an exchange with the US Army uh, one year um, and went full-time duty for that. I've done full-time duty to New Zealand and Fiji, all around the Pacific. Um, and my, my surveillance and um, reconnaissance work sort of fitted into what I do as this hobby. A lot of navigation, a lot of map reading. Um, um, you get a bit pedantic about where you're going and where you've been because you're you're looking all the time so um, my policy is I'll look once I'm not going back to have a second look I either do it properly the first time or or don't do it so um, and I work for an airline at at that time I worked for an airline in Darwin Uh, work shift work we had a lot of um, um, a lot of weekdays off Uh, shift work was mainly weekends so I was able to go bush um, hunting and fishing and, and I find these wreck sites from the war um, Now I've seen a photograph of you hanging out of a Huey, well, what's that story? Oh, uh, I did um, I did air assault when I was with the US Army um, mainly out of Iroquois and Hughes 500s, little birds um, and we did a, a final air assault operation 
and it was a it was a full on assault. There was heaps of helicopters, heaps of blokes, and um, and it was all full tactical, um, you know, everything except the shooting back. And uh, we come in on air assault, and we actually landed on this time. We usually bailed it, you know, a couple of feet off the ground, a metre off the ground or something. But we actually come in and landed. And uh, I was I was a team leader on that side of the air corps, and we bailed. And and uh, sitting in the long grass was an army photographer, which I thought was a bit obscene, seeing as though it's supposed to be full tactical, and there was enemy dressed as Russians running everywhere, and this bloke was taking photos. Photographer. Yeah. So he took. I didn't realise he took my photo. He took a, a, a lot of photos, and they were up on battalion wall in headquarters back at, at base. And um, and then one of them appeared in a Time or a Newsweek magazine, and there was an article on whatever it was, and they wanted a photo, and they used my photo. And that was used on all sorts of army um, articles. Didn't didn't relate to air assault, but they just used my photo. So. <laughs> It must have been a good photo. And and you mentioned the airline, now that was ANSET. What were you doing with ANSET before the, the end of all things ANSET? Um, I worked, I worked, um, I started work at ANSET out on the ramp um, about six months after Cyclone Tracy. I went through Cyclone Tracy and helped clean up. And once again, there was about 40 or 50 aircraft destroyed during mm. the cyclone. So I helped clean up and I ended up uh, you'd go to the high school in the morning and they'd say we want 50 blokes and two trucks to go wherever and this day we got sent to the airport and there was all these wrecked aircraft everywhere so I thought this was good so I used to turn up there every day for weeks and weeks cleaning up these aircraft yeah. um, and I worked for ANSET out on the tarmac and it started to go sour about um, four years before it fell over and a lot of people could see this coming and a lot of people didn't want to see it. Um, you know, blokes that I work with, most of us had well over 25 years service. So people were concerned about their super and, you know, what they're going to do as a job. Most of us were of an age where it was far too young for retirement. Mm. Twelve months before it fell over, I thought, I've got too much invested here. So I applied for a package and I got that package... 13 days before the airline collapsed. Got all my money, got all the checks, got every penny owing. In fact, they paid me a little bit more, but I never admitted to that. Um, and guys that I'd worked with for 25 plus years got nothing, got nothing. It was just dreadful. People yeah, were dreadful. committing suicide and yeah, mental yeah. illness. It was just dreadful. Oh, it was a major collapse, wasn't it? I mean, Ansett was a huge, yeah. not only employer, but an iconic company with a huge history. So I'll come to you for financial advice if I, if, uh, if I need it, Rick. So let's get to this obsession. You call it an obsession. You go hunting for derelict aircraft. Is that it? Uh, basically anything that's had an accident, that's been shot down, that's crashed, that's um, come to grief, I seem to be attracted to these things. Um, and Darwin was good for that because there was a lot of aircraft from the war that were, were shot down, destroyed, crash-landed, whatever... Um, so there's plenty to pick from there. Um, I used to do it on my own and then I, I hooked up with a bloke who used to do it as well, just by accident. And then he worked with a guy who had been doing this from the early 50s. He'd gone to Darwin with the old PMG mm. and, and had this interest. So he was doing it sort of five years after the war. So he became a, a researcher and... Um, it ended up a sort of a trio and um, the researcher was getting a bit old to, to do this so the other guy and I would go out and, and um, he would say have you seen this wreckage or what? and tell us about it so I'd go out and have a look and the, um, the agreement was I'd, I'd survey it, I'd GPS it, um, heaps of photos, heaps of videos, sort of record that crash site um, and give him the, that information for his archives, which was which will go to NT government. So they'll get all of this information. Mm. And then it got to a stage where John would say, um, look, I've looked for this thing for 20 years, I can't find it, do you want to go and have a look for it? So he'd give me all the information he had, and we'd do a lot of research. Um, the internet was sort of just coming in then, so we, we got onto the internet. 
and I'd go and do, um, I'd go and look for stuff that hadn't been found, so or had been found and forgotten about. Some of the stuff, um, wartime stuff, um, the, the Air Force would send people out to see what was useful in the wreck and for the casualty, if there was a casualty. Um, so I'd go out and, you know, sort of look for this stuff. And So you mentioned the Northern Territory. What states have you done this in? Um, um, in Western Australia. I did some work in Western Australia. There's um, some interesting crash sites there. There was a DC-3 shot down coming down from Java, I think, to Perth, full of refugees during the war. And it had a consignment of diamonds on board and the Japanese shot it down and it crashed on a beach north of Broome. Very little of it left. There's some bits and pieces sort of off the beach. but um, So I've been to that wreck site. There's actually a memorial there now to that site, and yes, those diamonds went missing, of course, uh, and has been of an interest to, to uh, treasure hunters, of course. But so, what did you locate this wreck? Yeah, we. Ha- I, I got a position for it. I mean, it was up the coast, whatever it was, um, and I just we just went up there and looked for it, and did the coast, and just kept looking, and until we found that area, we had the name of a bay, but you need good maps to get all this sort of stuff on the maps but found it never found any diamonds we look for the diamonds yeah, well. <laughs> look for the diamonds and and as i understand it that's the sister ship of our dc3 here at the museum yeah i think so yeah it was um there was a lot of not all people were killed there was mm. minimum killed on it they shot it up after it crash landed mm. um, but there was some survivors so i've been to that one uh, various wartime stuff, Ansons and Hudsons and that over in the Kimberley um, because they got hammered as well from the Japanese. Broome got flogged um, by the Japanese. A lot of um, Dutch seaplanes in Broome Harbour. You can go out on low, low tide and see them. Um, um, I've been to a, a Liberator site up on uh, Gulf Carpentaria. I actually flew over that helicopter. I've never been on the ground at that one, but I flew over in a Bell 47. Um, and I've seen wreck sites of um, aircraft up the coast that they were ferrying to New Guinea during the war and got lost or run out of fuel or something. I've been to a couple of those, but there's nothing left there. Um, I found um, Shirley Strawn's Bell 47 that's up on the mountain at the back of us. Wow. Um, found that um, only about five weeks after he was killed. Um, there was a Dragon Rapide crashed up up the road here coming back from an air show somewhere they got caught in weather and um, crashed I think there were six killed in that I've been to that wreck site I was there about a week after that crashed um, another one out the back of Peachester they were we are not sure what they were doing but two blokes hit a hill killed them uh, an ultralight down at Glasshouth Mountains that fell out of the sky into a forest Okay, so you, you do, you're currently still doing this whenever there is uh, a crash, but you're also looking at the historical opportunities of war, wartime aircraft and so on. Now, how do you go about looking for, say, a Hudson or a Spitfire or something that's crashed decades ago and it may have been known at the site at the time, but it's been lost since or it wasn't known or whatever? What's the process you go through? You did mention the internet and so on and GPS. So how do you actually go about finding these things? Um, A lot of hard work, basically. You just have to put the time in on the ground. Um, We used to have an expression that a pilot's got no idea where he is and and wouldn't know how to read a map if his life depended on it because they get to know the area that they're flying in by flying in it. You know, they recognise landmarks and rivers or whatever. So, I mean, current pilots, they would know where they are. They'd look at a GPS screen, but um, um, that was always a problem that you would get a position off a pilot and it would be, you'd think you were doing okay and it would be miles out. It would be 15, 20 kilometres out. Um, I found there was an incident where an Australian guy in a spitty shot a Japanese bomber down in 43 I think it was 
He shot the bomber down and he blew his engine up and it caught fire and the, his Spitfire was on fire and he bailed out, badly burnt. He couldn't get out for a while, but badly burnt. And he landed in the middle of nowhere, it's now a national park, and he landed on a hill, on a ridge, and um, didn't know what to do. I mean, you know, this bloke had no idea on the ground, had no idea where he was, but two days his squadron mates found him on this hill because he was waving his parachute at them. So he attracted their attention and then they flew every day and kicked out water and you know food and that sort of stuff and about six days after I think it was they sent a commando team to rescue him so the and the, and the commando team I think there was about eight commandos and a couple of bushmen and they got to him and they walked him out so he was he was missing for about eight days before he got back to bachelor so we had a position uh, southwest of Bachelor, we had a distance. Well, um, I work in mills, so in degrees, uh, it was probably um, 40 degrees out, and it was 16k in distance out. So that's a, you get that initial position, but you then have to find the, what you're looking for. So that took about um, five years. I walked um, over 200 kilometres around this national park. Just with a backpack, and I'd do. I set a. I sort of set a base camp up where I'd go to, and that had a fireplace in, and it was cleared, and all the rest hidden. Nobody knew it was there. And I then do loops. So each loop would be, say, four or five days, because that's what I could carry on, on in a backpack. And then I'd go back to the base, have a day off, do another loop, and um, sometimes I'd be gone for a couple of weeks, I suppose, at a time, just do it on my own. Um, my partner was very forgiving. I'd leave her a map where I went, <laughs> and I'd say to her, "You know, I'm due back yeah. 14 days. Give it an extra day before you go to the police." But, and I used to think, "Well, that's pretty. That's okay." Because I carried a GPS and an EPIRB and flares and all, all that sort of stuff. I had a handheld radio, but it was only um, VHF, so that was basically useless. But I used to think fairly smugly that. Well, you know, if I was a day, well, day's nothing. But then I got to thinking, what happens if I break a leg on day two? You know, I've got until day 14 <laughs> and, and then an extra day. So my partner was always, yeah. she was always concerned about that. But nothing had happened. I had some, you know, incidents, but nothing, nothing serious. It, the, well, it's a serious attempt, though, that you're making to, to go through all of that. So you found this Spitfire, and uh, what condition was it in after 19, all these decades? Actually, we never found the Spitfire. We decided if we if we were to find the Spitty, we had to find where this guy landed, because when he was coming down the parachute, he wrote of this event for the Spitfire Association, and um, when he was coming down the parachute, he gave us a direction and a distance of two fires, and we think... One was the Japanese bomber and one was his Spitfire. So we said if we could find this hill, we could then reference off the hill for the Spitfire. So the Spitfire had never been found, nor had the Betty bomber. So the crew would still be on board the Betty. So uh, I found, after a lot of walking and a lot of mistakes and all the rest, and we, I ended up, we, I found the hill and we identified the hill. The the patrol reports from the commandos and the report from the pilot and also some very limited reporting by his squadron mates. There was a, a hill involved, this ridge. There was a knoll out to the northwest. There was a series of water holes to the north. There was a waterfall involved. So I had to sort of put all of those bits and pieces into a hill. So I think I checked, um, I think it was 27 hills or something that matched, but the, those other bits didn't match, so I'd yeah. go to the next hill. So um, I finally found this one and everything fitted in. The, the water holes were actually a river, but when this happened, it was a series of water holes. The waterfall wasn't flowing because it wasn't wet season, but I found where the waterfall was actually hidden 
so there was a waterfall there, although it wasn't running. The knoll matched up. Uh, the directions the commandos gave didn't match, but that didn't really matter. The position the pilots gave didn't matter. Um, I had found the hill, so we, after finding the hill, we worked out where the commandos came in and where they left. So um, after all those years of looking for that, and I also did other stuff as well at the same time, um, I never had time to look for the Spitfire. So the Spitfire was unfound until my mate sent me a cutting out of the paper, I think 2016, I think they found the Spitty. I've got photos of it, I've got a good reference for it. Mm. The photos show this thing hammered in, at, I don't know what speed, but that snapped the guns off it. The guns are stuck in the ground like star pickets and the aircraft disintegrated around mm. those guns. So um, he wouldn't have survived the accident, but he had bailed out. So um, that grid reference, that's all been handed over to the NT government. They've taken control of it. Yeah. So nobody goes there. It's in a national park and they don't like people enjoying themselves in national parks. Not like to walk around. You just, you know, go to the local picnic area and then go home. So I've not been to the wreck site and I'm the only one that's been to the hill out of, out of our group. So, I mean, even not finding it, that's still a fascinating story to get to that point, to find the hill and to know that... So you must have been within how many kilometres of the actual crash when you found the hill? I was within 200 metres of that Spitfire. I walked past it 200 metres away, but, of course, you don't, you don't see... You might see in some country, you might see only 10 metres... But I, I was with 200 metres, yeah, yeah. What's the most interesting... Uh, this is probably an unfair question because they're all interesting in one way or another, but tell us one of the most interesting or most satisfying finds. Um, some of them are really sad. Um, a, lot of, a lot of this stuff has been policed during, you know, after the crash. The RAF would go out there, recover bodies or whatever, but if you go through um, a wreck site and you find keys, you know, like on a key ring. You know they belong to the pilot. You know the pilot was killed in this and I sort of used to wonder, are they keys to his mum's front door or are they keys to his foot locker or you know, whatever. That, that was always sad. Um, I found a grenade, in a, a live grenade in a kitty hawk. Apparently I, I wasn't aware of this but apparently some squadrons pilots would have a grenade in the cockpit with them so if they crash landed in enemy territory they'd drop this grenade in the cockpit and and leave well these aircraft all crashed on Australian territory so it wasn't enemy territory I don't know why they had grenades but I, I know of two wrecks that had them um, one was on the site of a, um, a government prison farm and they closed the prison, you weren't allowed in there, it was a quarantine area. They closed the prison farm which meant people would go there hunting and fishing and that. So we said well sooner or later somebody's going to find this kitty hawk and there'll be kids and people scratching around and they'll find this grenade and they'll, you know, something will happen. So it was decided with my vast army experience on grenades that I won the ticket to detonate this grenade. So the army wasn't going to come out and do it. It was, you know, 80k from Darwin. So, so I said, okay, you know, I'll see if I. So I, I went out, had it all worked out. I went out, dug a, dug a hole about a metre deep, took out some bags of uh, fire starters and heat beads, and put them in the hole and lit them. And then when when that hole was full of glowing heat beads. Uh, I went back to the wreck site and very carefully picked this grenade up and I actually suspended it with rubber bands so when I was carrying it the thing was you know sort of with this slight bounce um, I, I didn't think it was going to go off but you know you need to be careful so I took it across and I dropped it in this hole and then I, I went away and the wing off this kitty hawk was about 700 metres away so I went down there and took some photos I came back and this hole was still going so I thought I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll you know wait an hour and see what happens and I was going to come back the next week when the fire had burnt out and then filled the hole in so that was my intention so I was sitting down and I just made this cup of coffee and this grenade went off and 
frighten the life out of me. There's coffee everywhere. But, you know, you, you don't think of what may happen. Mm. But it blew all the heat beads out of this hole, all the, all the fire starters out of the hole, and blew them into the air. And, of course, they were all over the place. I had the best grass fire you've ever seen in your life. The, the grass fire started at about 200 places. Um, nothing I could do, so I let the fire go. But the grenade was then <laughs> not a problem. So, How far uh, from the grenade were you when it went oh, off? Oh, it was probably... Oh, I probably about 80 metres. I mean, I've, I've thrown a lot of grenades. They're, they're an evil little weapon, but um, I think they're good for... I think they're good for 8 metres. or Killing range, I think, is 8 or 10 metres. So I was well out of, yeah. out of the danger zone, but I didn't think it was going to go off. I thought it was so rusty and so old, it might fizz, you know, it might flare up or something, but I really didn't think it was going to go bang. Um, another one... Uh, we we had we heard a story of a cave that had a cave paintings in it, Aboriginal cave paintings, and this cave painting had a painting of a bloke in a parachute. So in that area, they had lost some aircraft going between sort of Townsville and Darwin in that line. So we thought maybe, obviously, they've seen somebody in a parachute. So was it somebody that you know bailed out? So we couldn't get a position on that and we got an area and it was very remote, horrible country. Uh, most of the stations there have been abandoned. Um, there's still tracks, but that's all they are. Station roads are all overgrown. So I went out there, I think three times I went out there and I, I figured it had to be in relation to a line of hills because it had a cave in it so it wasn't sort of open ground. So I went out there and just just worked that country and um, um, was walking down this line of hills. I think was actually a a um, a reef when Australia was underwater. I, I, that's sort of how the look it looked to me. So I was I was going down the side of this um, uh, reef and there was a bit of a, a re-entrant, a bit of a sort of a walk in which had an animal track in it. And I looked at it and, and thought, well, it's, it's a dead end. And I got down the range a couple of hundred metres and I thought, hang on, if it's got an animal track, maybe the animal, whatever it is, is sheltering in somewhere. So I went back, I walked in and there was an entrance to a cave It was about a metre high and the, the tracks went into this cave so I walked back and the sun was right and I pulled my survival kit out, I used to carry a survival kit and it had a mirror, it had a signal mirror so I got out and I shone the sun into the cave because you, you don't want to go in there it's like um, the old mutton birders you know when they used to put their mm. arm in a mutton bird burrow and find a tiger snake so they, they, my uncle used to do it so they used to use a mirror to have a look in the so I had a look in there and there was nothing there and when I poked my head around I could see a big opening so I thought that's on the other side of the of this reef. So I scrambled over the top and got down and there was a big opening about two and a half metres high and I walked in and it was just a cathedral of, of paintings. It just I couldn't believe it. I've, I've taken a lot of photos. We sent them to um, um, Perth University, you know, were they interested in them? And on the wall is a is a parachute with a bloke hanging in this parachute. It's absolutely unique. Um, so that was what we used to call the parachute cave. We don't believe very few people have been there. I destroyed my vehicle getting out of the place. It was just terrible country. So when you alerted the university, were they interested? Oh, sort of. Um, really? The trouble with, with these universities, we, we found a we found a um, B24 that had come down from a great height. Um, it went nose first into a creek in the wet season, so the whole aircraft went into the creek, under the right. creek, under the ground. Right. And they mistook that aircraft for another B-24, and they misnamed them, and the other B-24 said to be missing. Well, in fact, they'd found the other one, and this B-24 was the one missing. Um, and we, and we ID'd it from the top of a rudder. There was numbers there. That was the only bit sticking out. And the, over the years, the, the the rains, the wet season had washed this bank away, 
that had changed the direction of the creek, bits and pieces of aluminium and wires and all sorts of stuff had sort of come up. You know, that, um, authorities at, at another university were told of that and they wanted to go out there and tear the whole lot out of the ground and we said no, no, because the, the bodies are still on board that thing. So it's really a, a war grave and as much as we would have liked to have had it done, we weren't happy with what they intended to do, so we wouldn't tell them. We, we wouldn't tell them the position. But does Australia have a War Graves Commission that would take uh, take that seriously and uh, process it? Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, well, they must have because they brought our blokes from Vietnam back a couple of years ago. They yeah. bring blokes back from different areas. But the Americans got a massive facility in Hawaii, um, mm-hmm. and that was an American bomber. So they were American crew. So I would think, I don't know whether they were ever told, I would think knowing there have to be <coughs> ROB on that aircraft, um, ROB uh, remains on board, they would have to come out. They'd be obliged to come out. But I'm unaware that they've ever done it, so perhaps they've never been told, I don't know. I can understand the... Uh the attraction, why, why it would become an obsession. I mean, A, it's a, it's a huge detective process, isn't it, to find something, yeah, yeah. but B, you know, you're, you're looking at significant, historically significant uh, information here and able to fill in gaps. And you're writing a book about this, of course. <laughs> no, 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 I don't even, I don't even talk about it. I, my brother's in the airplanes, he's sort of, you know, I've spoken to him about it, but... Um, it strikes me it would make a great doco. So if anyone's listening with a, with a million bucks and they want to make a doco about, you know, your obsession, yeah, it, uh, it would be, look, a fascinating bit of history. And let's put it this way, there are other obsessions that could be far worse. And so, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not the worst thing you could be doing. Rick, thank you very much for telling us all that. And, and uh, if, if anybody wants to have a yarn to you, you're in here at the Queensland Air Museum on Tuesdays and Wednesdays normally. You're wearing the high vis because you're in charge of the workshop. I'm sure you'd be happy if someone wandered in and wanted to either talk to you about a particular wreck or just uh, pick your brain about something. Yeah, absolutely. I've had a lot of not a lot of people but people ring me up and say you know do you know anything about this wreck site or do you know of spitfire parts well most of the spitfire parts are unusable but i've had contact from a lot of people asking oh, i'm always willing to talk to them it's you know if they're interested in my subject i'm interested as well so yeah anytime that's all right rick thank you very much absolute pleasure so that's our episode for today thank you for listening Rick Wilkins is the uh, Restoration and Conservation Manager at the Queensland Air Museum. And if ever you wanted to catch up with him, you're most likely to find him on duty on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Next week you're going to hear from two retired pilots, who, both of whom have very long aviation careers, talking about their experiences of working for BPA, the Bush Pilots Airways an iconic, if I can use that word, Australian enterprise, which perhaps many may not really be familiar with. Bush Pilots Airways will be hearing from Ross Warren and Eric Cooper about their experiences as pilots with Bush Pilots Airways. Thanks for listening. Don't forget we're open from 10am to 4pm every day except Christmas Day and Easter Friday. Come in and see us soon. We would love to meet you. Bye for now.